Det var inte på Bengal, utan på ett byggt märkligt språk som inte är alldeles kallt som på Hadjavuli. Och därför tänkte jag att vi bjuder in Heinz som kan allt om indiska språk, nordindiska språk. Att berätta vad Hadjavuli är för något. Och lite om kultur och religion i Hadjavuli-regionen. <laughs> Welcome all of you and thanks a lot for the introduction, thanks a lot for the invitation to come to Lund. Always a great pleasure to be in Babu and Lush House. Don't worry too much, I will not speak only about boring linguistic issues about language. <laughs> I will go also a little bit into the contents of what these Brush Bully songs are about. And I try to restrict myself to half an hour that was given to me. Um, and of course, Rabindranath Tagore, particularly when he was young, he started to discover a lot. Uh, he was looking around in North India. What are our traditions? Where is our substance? What is our identity? These were very important questions in the beginning of, the, let's say, the creation of anti-colonial resistance. I mean, the question of identity, which is again nowadays a very important question in, in well, in all of South Asia, one has to say, not only in India. Uh, and um, in this course, he, as a very young man, discovered Brajbuli. Uh, you may all you all know that he wrote in this Cholit Bhasha, this modern Bengali, the spoken language of Bengali, which was basically through some of the authors of the 19th century and through Tagore made into a literary language. Uh, the old Bengali language, the Shadu Bhasha, is more complicated grammatically and also it has a little bit another set of vocabulary than the Cholit Bhasha, the spoken language, which developed slowly, among others, through Rabindra Tagore into a literary language. But he also dis was aware that the Bengali tradition included this uh, a huge part of this multilingual setup of North India, and particularly Brajbuli was important. Brajbuli is basically a language that was created by um, by um, Vidyapati. Well, this I mentioned this in the in the beginning that he wrote as a young man this Bhanu Singh Thakure Padavali, the songs of Bhanu Singh Thakur, which came out in 19 in sorry 1884. This is wrong. In 1884, uh, when Tagore was 24 years old, but he started to write as a very young man. He was the son of a very wealthy family who had a lot of land in most in what is Bangladesh nowadays. And so he, went, he was a very intellectual person, young man, introverted, but open to all these questions of what, that I mentioned in the beginning. So he discovered the world of Rajbuli, and it just together with the discovery of the Krishna lyrics. Because Braj, the language of Braj, the Braj is basically the region where uh, Krishna was born. You know the Krishna of the 10th book of the Bhagavata Purana, at the same time, there are other biographies. This is a Vishnu Purana in Sanskrit, and an appendix to the Mahabharata, which is called Harivansh, the dynasty of Hari. Hari is also Krishna in this case. And uh, so he discovered this, and he was he was asking about the contents of these songs. Is this basically theology, or is this about emotions? Is this about uh, everything that? Wh what is the meaning of bhakti in the end? So he discovered this, this Krishna and was very much related, not so much to Bengali, but to this Brajbuli <coughs> language, which was known all over in, in let's say, northeastern India, Assam and Uriya's, uh, Orissa, the same. And, uh, but basically it was a language that was, as a literary language, created by a certain Vidyapati in, the, uh, in around 1400. Uh, I come to that, but he, this is why he wrote one of the poems <coughs> in uh, in uh, Bhanu Singh Thakuri Padawali, and everybody knows Bengali sees at immediately that this is not Bengali. I am reborn again, I want to be a boy in Braj. Uh, this would bring great honor to my family. Uh, so he uh, is imagining himself to be reborn in Braj. And Braj, basically, the, the Krishna biography starts with his birth in Mathura, what is Mathura, which is uh, Western uh, UP nowadays. It's not very far from Agra. And then he was, under dramatic um, uh, circumstances, brought by his father to Vrindavan and brought up there. And this is the language, basically, of this region, the Brajmanlal. 
and Brajman, and um, this is also the reason why the Braj language, which is nowadays usually, let's say, considered to be a dialect of Hindi, is a kind of trans-regional literary dialect, trans-regional. <coughs> so it's not just a dialect, it's a trans-regional literary dialect. And when you go back to older Hindi literature, it's clearly Braj that is one of the two dominating dialects in, in, uh, in Hindi before modern standard Hindi Kariboli became the ex accepted uh, language norm. It's the same, well, the similar discussion went on in other Indian languages, including Bengali, with this Cholid Bhasha and Chandu Bhasha thing. What is the standard dialect? What is the Rik Senska, in our terms, so to say? And uh, the Braj Bhasha was quite dominant, particularly for the Vaishavite uh, um, um, uh, traditions in in Hindi literature as well as in Bengali, but because Braj is somehow in the Hindi-speaking belt, it, it's had a certain attraction for Bengali authors who would particularly relate to this Vidyapati, to write in this language, and immediately when one hears this language, it thinks of Krishna and all the things that happened in Braj. That's the background of the importance of the Braj language in Bengali. However, the Braj Bhuli, that Tagore wrote in and that many others wrote in Narottam Das, Vararam Das, Gyan Das, etc. It's not exactly this transregional Braj, but it's a, a Brajified, a Brajification is a term that Alison Bush uses, language of Maitil, Maitil, Mithila, of the Mithila region. I come to that. Um, nowadays, this Mithil, Maitili, Mithilanchal is one of the 22 national languages in India. 22 according to the 8th schedule of the Indian constitution. And of course it has an old literature, so Vijayapat is not the only one, there are a lot of, it's a, it's a big language nowadays. Even though it was considered also as a Hindi dialect until the beginning of the 2000s, when it all of a sudden became a national language. We are talking about this region here. It's in the north of Bihar. You see this is uh, the rich region, uh, region is now Bihar. It has, Bihar it has become very small because some 20 years ago, Jharkhand was created in the south, which is an Adivasi-dominated uh, state in India. And Bihar, in uh, this is Jahar, part of Jharkhand. And uh, Mithila is basically in the north, close to the border of Nepal. And also the Terai in Nepal is also by many uh, taken as part of Mithila, the region of Mithila. Mithila, that also gives a ring to every Indian, is basically the region where Sita comes from. Janakpur is uh, Sita's place where she comes from, and Maitini is also the region where she is from. So it has a, also not only a relationship, this language, to Krishnaism, but also a little bit, at least, to Ramaism. See, we have the Mithila region. There are certain movements in the region now that demand their own state in Mithila. Uh, but I don't think it will, they will succeed, because if this happens, Bihar will be very small on the end. I, well, you can split up India into so many parts if you want, but I mean, one has to be rational, where is the limit to split up India? So anyway, we talk about this Vidyapati. Uh, uh, this is a quote from him. Uh, it's said to come to go back to him, it's not sure. Local language is sweet to all. So this was these efforts in the, let's say, the time of Vidyapati and all over in northern India when a lot of authors started to write, to compose, Man, some of them were illiterate, but to compose in, I don't like the term local languages, but in the language that was spoken in North India, um, including Braj and Avadi, and in this case Madhubani, and uh, Madhubani, which is uh, nowadays the standard dialect of my Tili language, and uh, many other languages. So the idea to write Bhakti poetry, devotional poetry, in the spoken language, became very strong. It was almost like a revolution in this century. Mm -hmm. You have to go back. When we go back to the Bhagavata Purana or Vishnu Purana, I mentioned Harivansha, and uh, I mean most of what we say classical literature of Hinduism is either Sanskrit or Tamil. So basically, this was not the language of the people who would understand it. I mean, you need a complicated education to understand Sanskrit. Maybe some parts and bits you would understand as a normal Indian, but not the complete <coughs> contents. So the idea was always that in the tradition of Brahmanism that there was a priest mediating between you and the divine somehow. So the priest would read out the 
the, the religious part, for you, the mantras or whatever it was, he would, he would do the puja, he, basically mostly a he, he would do the puja, he would read the mantras, and you would profit for it. This was the so-called Jajmani relationship of the individual believer and the priest. But now all of a sudden came up this idea, no, there is an individual relationship to God. I mean, there are traces of this, of course, that go back even to Vedic literature. Individual relationship to God, not a non-priestly mediated relationship to God. And that would kind of bring forward the idea of bhakti, of individual devotion. And the whole idea that what happens in your heart is the essential. It's not the ritual, it's not the temple, but what happens in your heart is the essential of what we, what we usually call the dharma or religion. And uh, this Vidyapati was one of the basic, was one of the, you know, the, the, one of the main, let's say, heroes of this uh, movement. And all of a sudden, these, these pads, uh, the padavali, you remember Bhanasing Chakurir padavali, pads they were called, the hymns, became very, very popular. They're still very popular. They're sung all over North India. So. Um, um, Tagore, the young Tagore became interested in this tradition, was asking, is this just something bygone, what my grandmothers would sing, whatever, or is this something that relates to me as a person, as a young man? By the way, he was not only interested in my thing, he was also interested in Hindi. He was the discoverer of Kabir. So Kabir was almost forgotten. I mean, Kabir, the most, perhaps the most important nowadays, uh, uh, let's say, uh, reference of what is called early modernity in India, a very important question, what is modernity about? Is modernity colonization? Does it start with the Battle of Plessis 757 and that's modernity then, and then individualization, uh, let's say questioning of tradition. Is this modern, Western modernity colonization that was kind of put into India somehow and grew, and, or is, are there sources of modernity that go back before at least British colonialism or before Dutch colonialism, before the Portuguese colonialism? which means before 1498. So in this discourse, which is very important in India, early modernity, the early modernity discussion in Hindi or Bengali, Deshaj Adunita, uh, Deshaj, uh, modernity that is born from one's own country. Uh, Kabir plays a very important role because he questions traditions. He's very individualistic. He is anti-ritualistic and all these things. That was, of course, something that fascinated Tagore, and that was also fascinating for him to discover the Baal poetry in Bengali, and that was also, to some extent, also already the point in his discovery of the Brajbuli tradition. Um, yeah, the very term, now we talk about this Braj, on one side the Braj was in the Mathura region, Mathura Vrindavan, Govardhan, and all this region, and a lot of places of the uh, Krishna biography are still in the prosa of being identified. Uh, so there are a lot of stories, it's a, it's a narrative tradition basically, and a lot of places are not yet identified, and, but some are under discussion, so that's a long story. Uh, so Braj Bhasha is first of all related to this region, Mathura Vrindavan, but secondarily also it's, taught, it's related to, because of Vidyapati, to the Maithili language. And uh, this is something that um, that uh, creates an imaginative landscape of the Krishna story. And it's all about this scratch, by the way, in the Yamuna region, um, which is, uh, and I may, I may um, mention one of these Vidyapatis, who said the southern grief was soothing, a gentle touch kills lonely women, the poem of social life by here, see, I mean, let's say for a European, I mean, what is this about? <laughs> That's just some, some loo going on, okay, some wind, and what about this kids, lonely women? And uh, it's, I mean, but basically this is talking about one of the basic experiences in bhakti. I mean, bhakti, devotion has these several dimensions. There is the child Krishna, and this is Vatsalya bhakti, then there is a, a friendship between uh, the uh, gopas, the male, uh, herdsmen, but then there's also the, the, I mean, the highest form of bhakti definitely is love, Shingara bhakti, and love has two aspects, and they're both equally important. Sanyoga and Viyoga, or Viraha, which means being together with the beloved and separated from the beloved. So these two, and most of these Vidyapati songs are actually about Viraha, about Viyoga, about the suffering of the Gopas because Krishna has a way. So they suffer, and it's a it's a not just some some intellectual suffering or something, but it's a very emotional thing. They cry, they faint, 
and they, they, they do all kinds of crazy things. And they run into the forest and cry, call out Krishna, but he's not there, and uh, all these things happen. So this is what, what the background of these, these poems is. Uh, so the southern breeze. Uh, um, Scorch is like fire. So there are a lot of this also we have in the songs which you have you're going to hear soon. How can you forget that time? Purana uh, says diner kota bulvikire. But this is basically the the sentiments of the gopis, the the herdswoman from the village that fall in love with Krishna, and Krishna is away. Now can how can you Krishna forget this time? So it's an um, it's it's actually it's it, it, this is actually about the suffering because Krishna is away, and they make Krishna himself responsible for this, and it's also something which well, you also have this oh listen to him who plays the same uh, uh, and, and other things is also gradually this is the raindrop and what is what is this raindropping about. It has to do, of course, with the rainy season. The monsoon time is the time when, after the very hot summer, when the rain starts, it immediately gets colder, it's nice, and this is the time when you fall in love, when you play, and do all kinds of things. And it's also the time of Janmashtami, of the birth of Krishna. So the biggest Krishna festival is in the rainy season, basically. It's the eighth day of the Bhattarapada months in the rainy season. And, uh, so this is again, this is so when, when, when anybody hears this, Jim everybody, I think, will know this has something to do with Krishnaism and with Krishna. And the same, my beloved friend Radhika understands such a Chajani Chajani Radhika Do. Um, it's again, though the gopis talk among each other, they speak about, uh, I mean, they also, there's also this uh, irritation about Krishna. He's not there, then he comes again. You never know whether he comes or not. And, in the end, he goes away completely. But the emotionalism, or oh, I have to look at the time, is the current, is some of the substance of Krishnaism, this emotional thing. How does this relate to what we usually believe, what Dharma is about, Indian religion, Hinduism is about? This whole, I mean, high theological idea or philosophical idea about the identity of Atman and Brahman, the idea of meditation, the idea of mukti about liberation, whether in this life or whether later on. Uh, how does this relate to this intellectualism that is somehow inbuilt in, let's say, if we take the main proponent of the Vedanta tradition, Shankara, or the, it's usually called philosopher, in a way he was a theologian because he, his, his philosophy is about God. So, Theologos. Uh, <coughs> traditional dating is 788 to 820, but he was probably 100, 120 years older in this case older, and um, so his, his whole uh, intellectual Vedanta that was very popular in, particularly in the middle class Babu, uh, Kolkata um, society, uh, where the, let's say, this intellectual, um, this intellectual Krish, um, Vedantism with the idea of the identity of the individual soul and the divine, kind of was an ideal kind of projection of what Hinduism actually is about in its deepest sense. And this was the point that, that the intellectuals would, would kind of uh, underline in their, uh, in their interaction, in, the Apollo, uh, in their intellectual discourse with Christianity and Islam. How, how does this Christianism relate to them? For those people, it was not, I mean, they, they were not very fine with, they were not really happy, very happy with this Krishnaism. And it was sometimes called underdog Hinduism. I mean, the whole emotional, emotionalism of the Krishna, Krishna tradition. And they tried to play it down. But Tagore was not like this. He went into this. He started to engage with this, asking himself, I mean, people are spoke, speaking about their emotions. That's the basic point. And that's where he also went in his poetry. And all these references to the Krishnaism is, of course, part of the uh, religious tradition of India. It's not necessarily Hinduism in the in the sense of a belief system or so, but everybody knows about this. Um, yeah, so I don't. I will go over this. Of course, the history of Mithila, Upinan, and Thakur, and a lot of things. This is Krishna story by just some references. Here you have, of course, you have these childhood stories. The child Krishna was now very popular in North India. He was also very well known, let's say, 500 years ago, but he was not so prominent as today. 
more prominent in the in the past in the traditional world these stories with Radha and Krishna and with all the gopis looking for Krishna. Do you see? He's not here. They're in the forest, in the Kunju Kunja. Uh, they look around in the forest all over Kunja or Nikunja. And they don't find him. And they are extremely excited. So they cry, they imitate him, they play Krishna. So he plays like with the flute. I think this is a she makes like playing the flute. And so they imitate him, they play like this Leela. This is what Krishna Leela is about. The abs it's about the absence of Krishna. And in the absence of Krishna, they play him. But then he comes again sometimes and they have this rust dance and they have he does also all these kind of things. He's, he's a trickster kind of. He takes away the clothes of the gopis and sits with them on the tree and says, you just come and give you your sari. No, don't worry, but you just have to come. But they, of course, they don't want to be seen naked. But anyway, then in love in any case. And here also they, Krishna comes back in a way. But they are, no, sorry, this is another interesting scene. This is Udhav. So when Krishna finally goes to Mathura and leaves the gopis alone, bad guy, isn't it? <laughs> so he sends a messenger, and the messenger goes to the gopis, he starts to explain to them, I mean, come on, I mean, religion is about meditation and just think about the divine and all these things, it's very nice, but they, and they say, no, behold, you keep your, keep your intellectual for yourself. I mean, they explain to him, we are playing Krishna, we are looking for Krishna, we faint, we have all these emotional, and, and they talk with him a long time, it's also part of the Bhagavata Purana. And in the end, Udo, in the beginning, Udo is not, I mean, this is not religion, come on, I mean. But in the end, he gets convinced. So he says, okay, you're right, this is the higher, this is the more, you're spiritually more elevated than I am. And I, I forget about my intellectualism, and so this is what basically this, I mean, uh, Krishna is a full avatar, of course, that is, uh, my, most of you might know, ten avatars, and according to the Krishna tradition, there are these ancha avatars, part avatars, but Krishna is a full <coughs> avatar. So Krishna and Vishnu are identical. He's fully Krishna in a way. That's the point of Krishna. Is, and his absence is also an important part of this. Now, we speak about this Bhakti Kal, uh, and Vidyapati would fit into this somehow. Uh, this Vikramasa 1375, it's 57, 58 years advanced from uh, Anno Domini, from our, uh, from our calendar. Um, so he has a certain time for the Bhakti Kal, but of course there was Bhakti Pads hymns are written even today in different languages, including Braj. Braj is not a dead tradition. So this is a question of a category. Um, now, this, we spoke about this intellectualism and the, and the emotionality. Basically, this Ramchandra Shukra and many others construct these four kinds of bhakti traditions. Two nirgun and two sagun. What does it mean? Guna means quality, uh, attribute also. Nirgun is with quality, so with attributes of sagun would, uh, sorry, without, and sagun would be with qualities. So basically it's about um, Sagun would be God, it has avatars, he is present in the temple, in the murti in the temple. In which form can be discussed? Is it fully, is the murti just a representation of the divine or is it identical with the divine? And if it is somehow identical, perhaps not completely, I mean long discussions about this. How does the murti, the image and the, uh, that that it represents relate to each other? Basically this is Sagun Bhakti and Krishna is Rama is the basic two strands. And then there's Nirguna. Uh, I mean, uh, Ramchandra Shukla makes a very clear distinction. He would say, so the Kabir tradition, Kabir is, does not believe in avatars, he does not believe in the temples, in murtis, he's much more wild, so to say. Um, so this is Nirgun, and Sufi, Islam is also a form of Nirgun Bhakti. That's a very important, and very interesting and very important point in Ramchandra Shukla's uh, conceptualization of the history of Hindi literature. But when you go into the reality of the verses, you would find Nirgun and Sagun elements in almost all the poets. Even Kabir uh, has Sagun elements in his poetry. And of course, Surdas and the great uh, authors of the Sagun tradition also have Nirgun elements in them. So God is in a way a person, I mean, that's a, uh, the Abrahamitical uh, religions is a very important point. God is a person. So you're not just in a relationship of being that he's separate from you. You're basically he's separate from you. So he's he's a person you can relate to him or to her. 
in a way. So, but you keep to be separate. This is, and you see, the Atman Brahman identity thing is not like this. It would say in the end, okay, so Shankara had this teaching of the two truths. I mean, when you do puja with all these things, this is provisional. In the end, you will realize you are Shiva, and Shiva is you somehow. Uh, maybe in the extreme form in the Kashmiri Shaivism, where this, the idea is that what we do, or what we usually call being awakened, is actually sleep. So we are sleeping now, sitting here sleeping. You listen to me sleeping. <laughs> and when we wake up, when we get liberated, then we are awake. And then we realize, I am Shiva, etc. So this reminds very strongly to the Sufi tradition with this Al-Hajj, Anal-Haq, I am God. So in a way, you find this in every religion, in a way, this kind of internalization. Uh, and this also relates, I mean, Al-Hajj, when you read Anamar Shimmel's, a book on uh, the mystical dimensions of Islam, al Alaj is the reference for all the mystics in North India even, and, and well, in, also in the Arab world, in the Persian world. And uh, his memory is very much alive, even though Anad Haq, I mean, from a Muslim point of view, it's a very strong statement. Anyway, so you come to similar conclusions from different traditions, so to say, in a way. But you find this interesting mixture of Nidhi <coughs> and Sagun in all the poems. I have to come to the end, so I know. Basically, let's say in the Krishna tradition, and the, particularly in the Bengali tradition, the point that is, I mean, this is a big question, is God, is God Beda, is he separate, is he different, or is he Abheda? So the individual soul and the divine, are they Abheda, are they non-different? And then there is the next step was, Ramanuja came to that already, Beda Abheda, he is different and similar at the same time. And how is this possible? Long discussion, long discussion. Madhva would say, no, it's not possible, forget about it. There's a lot of polemics. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about the argumentative Indian. Amartya Sen did got the Nobel Prize for it. So it's not only mystical and spiritual evidence. The argumentative, it can be very sarcastical even. Uh, so Shankara, to whom I mentioned, was called a crypto-Buddhist by his opponents. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I want to go on this. The end of the conclusion is, this is Chaitanya, basically. Achintya Veda Veda. It's unthinkable. You cannot read, rationalize it. But it's different and same, same at the same time, and you cannot really rationalize it. <coughs> That's the point of Krishnaism, basically. And I think almost all the traditionalists would sign this uh, easily. A little bit on the language, but I have to, I think I go over this. Uh, it's basically, you have seen the region, the Tirai. Fortunately, uh, you know, this is the difference between Russia and India. <laughs> I mean, in a way, the Tirai in Nepal is part of Aryabhata. Of course, it's Hindu, and the language is also Indo-Aryan, and it has all these traditions of the Mithila region. Uh, so they're, they're very much in common with the Mithila region, and it's not... Uh, there's a wonderful novel, Panishwanath Renu's Maila Ancha, The Dirty Border, which I can really recommend you to read on this region and modernity around the time of independence. Uh, but uh, that's the difference between India and Russia. <laughs> that, I mean, India had reasons. If, if Ukraine is part of Russia, <laughs> India had reasons to go uh, militarily into the Terai also. But they, that will not happen. Don't worry. I'm not saying this. <laughs> this is a difference. I mean, uh, culturally, it is very. I mean, it's also Buddhism is very strong in both regions, historically also. So now I look upon the time. Here you see that I wanted to show my Tilly is part of Bihari and. And when you go to the, the Grierson's uh, Linguistic Survey of India, he has this idea that there are two, way, two immigration waves, and the Western, uh, Western Hindi, and then there's this Bihari, which is the outer, they have something in common, Marathi and Sindhi and Bihari, so Bihari would be closer, Maithili would be closer to Bengali than to Hindi. But for historical reasons, it was made into a Hindi dialect, so to say. Now it's an Indian national language, even. Uh, this is the Hindi region once again. Bihari, the outer language, is theory is outside, it's closer to Bengali in a way into here than to what is usually called Hindi. Um, I think I will go over these most of the things that I still have. But basically what I want to show you, this is the famous uh, Madhubadi painting, <coughs> which are very beautiful. It's a kind of, uh, yeah, in a way naive art, basically <coughs> women's paintings. Originally, basically, houses were painted like this, colored in, <coughs> but now they're also on paper from many years now. And they all refer, uh, most of them refer to the Krishna story, of course. Uh, here you have Kaliya Damana, this child Krishna, he plays the flute, of course. 
and he kills the bad, this bad snake. He's with the fierce Radha. He's the blue one and the, the white one. Uh, a lot of images we have when with this rain, this Gano Gano, we have the Rim Jim Gano Gano. This is also, I mean, this all over in the Krishna lyrics. The monsoon clouds coming, everybody's happy. So the monsoon is black, of course, that's Krishna. So he's black or blue. And the, the blitz, uh, the torrent, that's white, that's Radha. <coughs> that comes over and over. Everybody knows that. It's very much in the, in the deep layers of, uh, here Krishna sits on the tree. I like this very much. And the gopis are around looking for him. And of course, many uh, gods together. I think, since I leave, I have uh, half an hour now. That's yeah. over. Yeah. I think I will stop here. Uh, this is what Alison Bush I mentioned, or Brajification. So Madhubani region is basically very much related to the Braj region, also linguistically. And that is why it has this ringing for the Bengali ear. When one hears this language, it's a I must be Krishnaism and all these emotions that are together. Krishna who is present, Krishna who is away, Krishna who sends Uddhava, this silly intellectual who does not understand what real religion is about. And also it also gives an explanation why uh, emotions are important in religion in a way. So that's different from let's say Vivekananda, when we look for them to reform Hinduism, Vivekananda an important name. Very much fascinated by uh, Ramakrishna, as you know, Ramakrishna was a very emotional person, not a very intellectual person. But here is the intellectual Vivekananda, who is fascinated by Ramakrishna, by, let's say, a non, not very much educated priest of a Kali temple. And he starts in this order, but he leaves some of this emotion, emotion uh, let's say, this high level of emotionality behind. And, uh, um, so this is something different. So Krishnaism basically is, and that's what, what I think what Tagore fascinated in Krishnaism is that it's speaking about emotions. It's about emotions. It's about relationship to, not only to nature in that sense that is, I mean, romantic. I mean, Tagore, as you might know, all of you know, is very often reduced to a certain romanticism, nature, nature romanticism. But it's, it's, it, it, this is only one aspect of it. It goes much further. It, is about the relationship of the human being to to God. And let me stop at this point. I think I've already been on my time. Okay. Thank you.